All right, thanks, Keith. And so I realize on the, the last session of the day, keeping you from, uh, you know, the bar at night or hitting your planes or trains to, to head home. So my name is Troy Martin. I'm going to talk to you about setting performance expectations. And what I'd like you to think about during this talk is imagining what your results should be when you do a performance test. And then actually going through the test and seeing if your result matches up what you thought they should be. Are you pushing more traffic or less traffic? And understand what the difference is. So in The Republic, Plato wrote about the allegory of the cave. And in this story, if you can imagine, there were prisoners that from birth were chained up and they were only allowed to stare at a wall. And all they could see was the shadows cast on the wall. There was an entrance on the other side of the cave that light would shine through. And every now and then, dogs or horses or people would walk in front of this cave entrance and the prisoners would see the objects and the shadows cast on the wall. They'd hear the dogs bark or the people talk. And the reality and the forms that the prisoners saw were the shadows cast on the wall. Years later, one of the prisoners, the chains broke free and that prisoner escaped out of the cave and they left through the entrance. And they walked out of the cave and the light shone in their eyes and the brightness burned their eyes and seared them and it was a painful experience. But after they adjusted to it and they looked out into the world and they saw trees and they saw the dogs and the horses and the people, but they were still used to seeing the shadows. So to them, the real object was still the shadow cast by the sun of these objects that they saw. As they spent more time in the world, they got used to seeing these truer objects. So they saw the dogs for the dogs that they actually were and the people for the people they were. After a point in time, these, this prisoner that escaped was brought back into the cave to his prisoner mates and he tried to explain what he saw, that the, the shadows cast on the wall weren't the true objects or forms, that there were really dogs out there that had shapes in three, three dimensions. And the prisoners that he was trying to convince didn't believe him. They thought he was crazy. Right, and they actually they were angry at him and they outcast him inside the cave. And he wasn't able to convince them of this uh, different form or different reality. And so what I'd like to think you guys to think about is that sometimes uh, the things we think may not necessarily be true. So we always need to, always need to challenge ourselves and, and put, uh, put our thoughts to the test and validate what we're experiencing in our networks. Okay, so this ties into Peter's talk about always capturing the packets. You know, packets never lie. If you want to see what's really happening, make sure you test it. So again, my name is Troy Martin. I'm an SE with Aerohive Networks. Um, I have a, a few certifications, and what I wanted to emphasize with these is that I'd like to encourage everyone to, to set a goal, set a target, set a date for your exams, for the certifications that you want to plan, and go do it, right? Don't delay it. Make the effort, go out there and do it, okay? I've I've had a few hiccups along the way. I certainly didn't you know, get all of these on the first attempt. Um, if, if you don't make it, try and try again. Okay? The point is, go out and do it. Book the exam and make it happen. But of all these numbers here, I just want to talk about this one for a moment. Uh, number 36. So I'm a member of the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. And so this is a, a global society. Uh, they're one of the largest independent purchasers of Scotch Malt Whiskey in the world. Uh, and what they do with their whiskeys is they bottle everything in a green, a green bottle. This way you can't see the color of the whiskey. Uh, they also, instead of calling the, the bottles by the distilleries that they come from, they give them a numbered coating system. So the first number, in this case the 82, actually represents the distillery that this whiskey's come from. The number 19 represents how many casks they've bottled from this distillery. And if you look at the description, um, it, this is actually describes very accurately how this whiskey tastes. And so what I also want you guys to emphasize here and what they're doing, the purpose of the society is to experience and taste the whiskey for the whiskey itself. Don't come with any preconceived ideas or any bias of what the whiskey will taste like. Enjoy it for the, the, what it is. Right? So when you're doing your test, try not to bring in your, you know, your vendor bias or your operating system bias, um, but approach all the problems, all the testing you're doing with an open mind and, and look at what uh, the results mean and try and understand them. Okay, so a, a few things that I'd like to talk about. We'll talk about some land throughput, some basic tests. Um, have a little scenario that I'll walk you guys through. We'll talk about some WAN throughput testing. 
uh, talk about what happens in a rate limiting uh, exercise, and just uh, some thoughts about uh, default settings and where they come into. And some of these examples that I use uh, come from actual discussions that I've had with, car uh, with partners or customers or other people in the profession about understanding what's happening uh, as traffic passes through your network. So first, uh, because I'm going to be talking about different layers in, in the stack, uh, I want to talk about the OSI model. And I'm sure most of you have heard this before, um, you know, the seven-layer OSI model. But I want to talk about uh, the ten-layer model to see if you guys have all heard of that. So here's the seven-layer model. And because we're here for a Wi-Fi conference, uh, Wi-Fi itself operates at layer one and layer two of the OSI model. So at layer one, we're really caring about how the waveforms are, are blasted through the airwaves. And layer two, how we're organizing the bits uh, within our frame. But at layer eight, we have our political layer. Okay, this is the layer where this group of people, if tasked with designing a horse, they'd produce a camel. Okay, they're also the same group of people that could drive the need for a captive portal, which could negatively impact a uh, user experience. Okay. So not making necessarily the best decisions from a technical perspective, but they have immediate implications on what the user experience will be. Right? So these are good people to get in front of um, ahead of the game and talk to them about what their design objectives are for the network and what they want that user experience to be like. Layer 9 is the business layer. So this is a bit of a reality check. It's also where the funding for the project comes into play. If, if you, you can design the best network in the world with the best performance, but if you overspend your budget, you've done it wrong. You've failed at your, your task as a design. Okay? So you need to consider multiple variables when you're putting together your design and take that into consideration. But the tenth layer, uh, which ties uh, closely into uh, Scott's talk about AP placement, is the aesthetics committee. This can make and break a Wi-Fi design. Right? If you're not taking these people out for lunch and convincing them that access points are beautiful things that they can be below the ceiling tile, uh, you can run into some serious issues. I happen to think access points are beautiful things. I spend a lot of my time staring at the ceiling as I'm walking through malls and, and uh, different venues. I get really proud when my kids can point out access points uh, that they see on the ceiling. But the, the, and just imagine what the aesthetics, com uh, aesthetics committee will do uh, when we move to you know, wave seven of the 11AC standard and we have uh, eight, multi or eight uh, spatial streams with access points that have eight antennas and we'll see little spiders mounted on the ceiling. Right? It's going to drive the aesthetics people, uh, drive them mad. Okay? So let's talk a little bit about land throughput. And so what I'd like to do is just ask ourselves a question. If we turn on encryption, do we expect it to be an impact to the, to the performance of the network? Will we see less, less speed or less throughput? And so I'll take a little survey here. If I configure three different, three different SSIDs, if I have one set up as open, one set up with WPA using TKIP, and a third set up with WPA2 AES, will I expect roughly the same speeds with nothing else changed, or will one of these perform faster or slower than the other? Right, so just ask a question, who thinks the open network will have the best speed? Okay, what about WPA2 TKIP? Uh, WPA2 with AES? How, how many think they'll perform exactly the same? Okay. So, let's, uh, so I've had this discussion with people. Uh, they've come up with some, some ideas and can some, some potentially some valid reasons why they went down this path. Uh, one of the reasons that we ended up with TKIP it was kind of a, a stepping stone to get to AES. AES required a forklift in the hardware. Right? So there is a performance penalty already that we should be aware of moving to AES. Um, if we're not doing any encryption, maybe we can process those frames faster and move them through our network a little bit faster. Okay? Uh, so this is just a little sample network. Uh, so I'm basically passing traffic from one, ax or one uh, station to another. Uh, some things I wanted to point out, and um, uh, Fernay has identified this with the Odroid that we built. Uh, you want to understand what you're testing and what the... How, what the devices the traffic is passing through. Um, if you have a, a fast Ethernet port, obviously that could be your limiting factor if you're trying to drive 200 megs of traffic across your wired link. Okay? In this test here, both my stations are wireless. I should expect different results if one of them was wired and one of them was wireless. Right? They're, they're contending with each other for the same medium. Okay? So let's look at the results. Okay, for my open network, this is a default access point uh, with uh, nothing else can configure, just factory, factory settings. 
Uh, all they did was set it to open. I had about 216 megabits that I was pushing. Uh, when I configured WPA with TKIP and entered the password for that, it dropped down to about 32 megabits per second. And with WPA2 AES, it was about 213 mega, uh, megabits per second. So these are really interesting results. Uh, the first test and the third test are roughly the same, but that one in the middle, WPA, is a significant decrease in throughput performance. So why is that? Nothing else changed on the configuration of the router, but why do I see significant differences in my results? Exactly. Exactly. So one of the things that the IEEE has done, so here's the conclusion. I can say, well, I could just leave it at that. WPA2 has a significant performance increase or performance penalty. Um, that's what uh, crushes my results. It's just too intense for the processors to handle. Okay, but if we dive deeper, the implications of TKIP is that 11N isn't supported. Right? So we don't have a lot of the benefits of 11N. We lose the MCS rates and we lose channel bonding. Right? So those are two big reasons why we saw a significant performance decrease in our throughput just by changing the encryption type. Okay? Uh, so here's just a snapshot showing just by configuring WPA uh, that I dropped to 20 megahertz wide channels. So I moved from, from 40 uh, to 20 uh, just by making that one configuration change. Uh, other implications of using uh, TKIP in combination with, um, with AES is every time a station connects to an access point, it negotiates a unique key for that station in the AP. If I've also configured uh, support for TKIP on that network, I need to play to the lowest common denominator, and so I need to code my, my group-wise master key using TKIP. Right, so you can have a mixed environment where you're using different um, te encryption techniques for different types of traffic. Okay? While doing this test, I also wanted to point this out. So on the iOS devices with iOS 10, whenever you connect to an open network, you'll see a security recommendation. And if you click on this and drill down, now Apple is warning users that connecting to an open network may provide no security and expose all their network traffic. Right? So to non-Wi-Fi people, the, the you know, civilians that, that, that are out there, uh, they may be thinking, someone's attacking me. Someone's trying to compromise my device. So you could see pressure from the user community to start forcing or demanding that wireless network administrators start encrypting their traffic, connecting to guest networks or any open networks that are out there. Okay? Which isn't, isn't definitely not a bad thing. I think that's a fantastic thing. We should be encrypting all of our traffic at layer two. But we could start to see pressure from the user community asking for that. Uh, just because they're thinking their devices are being hacked. Also, when you configure a WPA2 network, WPA2, or WPA is also identified uh, as being insecure. So you get messages for users who have that network configured as well. Okay? And so this is an interesting flowchart that's come up a, a few times. So I think it was Adam that flashed the, this flowchart uh, in front of your eyes. And I know Rob's referred to this uh, white paper that Marcus Burton put together. And so I want to do a, a really quick job of just running through this flowchart because I want to compare it uh, to what happens on the Ethernet side and highlight the inefficiencies that are, that are out there with Wi-Fi. Right, there's a lot, a lot of lost talking time with uh, Wi-Fi. So if you imagine yourself trapped inside a radio interface and you can only stick an ear out of the hole or your mouth out of the hole where you can listen to, the, to traffic or to uh, RF energy that's out there and you listen and listen and listen and if it's too loud outside of the radio interface, you're not able to transmit. And if you can hear another Wi-Fi frame go by, within that frame it tells you how long it's going to take to complete sending that frame. You're not allowed to transmit. But if, you, if you're listening and it's quiet and you don't hear any other frames whizzing by, uh, you can pick a random number, right? And you count down your random number. And if that random number hits zero and you still haven't heard anybody else, uh, uh, another frame whiz by, and you haven't heard you know, more RF energy in the environment, you can, you can yell what you have to say out that radio interface. But when you yell it, you lose the ability to listen to what else is going in the environment. So while you're in the middle of yelling your traffic out of your radio interface, someone else might be yelling out of their interface. So you might have a collision. The only way to detect if there's been a collision is to wait for an acknowledgement from that receiving radio. If you get your acknowledgement, everything was kosher. Um, if you don't have acknowledgement, you can assume a collision. Right, so there's a lot of time spent where you're waiting for these acknowledgements to come back. Okay, so I just want to take a, a little bit of a pause, take a reflection on some of the technology that we've lost, and just remind people that sometimes you need to let old technology go. Right, and so I want to make a comment about uh, the 2.4 band. 
there's a lot of talk about how the 2.4 is dead. I think a, a good technology um, position that we hold is let's let go of older rates. Let's shut off 11B entirely. I think it's time that we were ready to let 11B go. Right? We, one of the things that I think holds back the IEEE is their continued support for legacy-based protocols. Right? We just need to let it go and move on. So if we look at this chart, and this is just a chart that I grabbed from a wiki, which talks about the, the collision detection. Uh, so basically what happens on the wired side is the, the transmitting, the, the transmitter on the wired network, uh, basically it's listening for frames going across the, the wired, wired network. If it doesn't see any frames, it's allowed to start injecting one bit at a time. And now it can listen while it's adding one bit onto the wire. So in the middle of sending its frame, if it detects another device transmitting, it immediately stops sending a jamming se uh, sequence across the wired network. So that jamming sequence uh, creates a lot of, um, uh, creates some interference across, the, uh, across that wired segment and it corrupts the CRC. And so that uh, the receivers that were expected to receive those frames, they'd end up dropping those frames because the CRC was corrupted and you end up into retransmission story. And so devices that retransmit, they're picking numbers between zero and, or zero and 15, uh, counting down those timers and then blasting their frames onto the airwave. But they don't, Ethernet doesn't have to wait for layer two acknowledgements. Okay, so it's a lot more efficient and it's able to detect collisions mid-transmission. Okay, so th this is a little bit of a thought exercise uh, that sometimes I, li I like to think about. And so if you've studied statistics, there's a phenomenon called the birthday paradox. And in the birthday paradox, if you have a room of 23 people, there's over a 50% chance that two of them will have the same birthday. Okay, so to me that's interesting in the wireless world. Because in, in this birthday paradox scenario, essentially I have a, a range of 365 and I have 23 people essentially picking random numbers within that range. And there's a 50% chance that I'll have a collision with just 23 users. So on the wireless side, if I'm picking a random number between 0 and 15, how many clients do I need to have before there's a 50% chance that two of them are, will pick the same number? Right, so these smaller window sizes, there, there is a, in, so granted, in, in order for these guys, the devices to collide, they have to be wanting to transmit at the same time, so you have some other challenges like that. But it's just interesting to think about the implications of having a, a small window size and having devices statistically pick random numbers within that range. Okay. Uh, so again, we look at Ethernet frame sizes. Uh, that can range between uh, 46 and 1500 bytes. If we stuff those uh, frames and include the preambles and interframe gap, uh, we can build this model forward and look at the efficiency of the payload within Ethernet. So smaller frame sizes, there's a fair bit of overhead that's associated with each frame. So you, with 64 byte size frames, you're looking at about 66% uh, percent efficiency. Whereas if you pack longer data frames, more data into those payloads with 1500 bytes, uh, you can push towards 99% efficiency. So if you're doing a throughput test and performance testing and you want to see your maximum data rates, use larger frames, right? If you want to see smaller numbers or skew some results, maybe pick smaller frames, right? See how many packets per second those devices can process. So there's different goals with each of those tests. I'll get to that, I'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> And so if you compare that with the wireless uh, side, you can have you know, maximum MSDUs of uh, 2304 bytes. Uh, and then depending on what encryption type you're using, the overhead changes, right? So you have different size frames based on your encryption. So your overhead's slightly different and you can end up with different results. We even have null data or null data packets that uh, Peter was talking about. So we have frames that have zero payload, right? They're, they are used to exchange information, but they're not passing any data across the wireless network. Uh, which reduces your efficiency, right? So with wireless, you can have anywhere between zero and 98% uh, efficiency on the frames that you're sending across your, the airwaves, okay? And so there's some uh, documents produced by the RFC that standardize uh, testing techniques and procedures and different mixes of traffic that you can have to be more reflective of reality. So instead of blasting a single stream of 64 byte frames or a single stream of 1500 byte frames, maybe mix up those, those ratios, right? Because you have small frames, if you have some voice traffic on your network, some basic acknowledgements, and you may have some larger frames from your data file transfers, 
right? So you could have a mix uh, shown in this slide, and so this is pulled out of the RFCs themselves, where you have, you know, 23% of your traffic are 64-byte frames, and 10% of the traffic is 1,000-byte frames, right? So that be might be a more realistic test of what you'd see on your network. Other examples of how this can play out, you can have different combinations. Uh, so if you really wanted to model what was happening on your network, uh, do a study, maybe over a week, maybe over a month, perhaps just a day. But look at the size of frames that are being passed over your network. And get an idea for you know, how many are small frames, how many are large frames. And do some more realistic testing using a mix of those different frame sizes. Now getting to the point about how you can skew the results. If, if I want to show uh, the best performance, best throughput testing, I'll use as large of frames as I can to be most efficient as possible in de delivering payload. So most testing sheets that you might find on, on data sheets, or testing results you'd find on data sheets, is using the larger size frames, right? Which isn't reflective of what we typically find on your network, right? So you can skew the results that way. Okay, so let's look a little bit at uh, WAN throughput. Uh, so this is a picture that I saw recently on Twitter, which I think really summarizes the, the effectiveness of uh, UDP. But of course, TCP is connection-oriented and UDP is connectionless. Uh, TCP has higher overhead. Um, it also waits for acknowledgments to come back, so there's only so many bytes it puts out onto its medium before it gets its act back, uh, which slows it down. Okay? Uh, so there's another thought exercise I'd like to walk you guys through. And so in this uh, scenario, uh, you have your army, and you have an allied army, and you're under attack um, by a larger army that's in the middle. Okay, and you need to coordinate your efforts with your allied army so that you can attack at the same time. Because if only one of you attacks, you'll be too small and be crushed by this larger army in the middle. So how do you coordinate a time to attack? Say you want to attack tomorrow at noon. How do you coordinate this with this army on the other side? So hopefully you encrypt your communications when you send it to your allies, but you send the message, hey, let's attack tomorrow at noon, okay? You send this message out, but how do you know the army, your allied army on the other side received your message? What if you start to attack and they don't meet you in the middle, right? Then you lose and you lose all your troops. So you wait, so you wait for an acknowledgement to come back. Now your allied army sent you an acknowledgement, but how do they know that you received their acknowledgement? How do they know that you're gonna meet them in the middle and hearing your confirmation? So you act back to the Allied Army for the original ACK. But how do you know they received your ACK from their ACK? So they ACK the ACK of their ACK. Right, and this keeps going on forever and ever and ever. So where do you draw the line? Where is enough ACKs en enough? Right, so it turns out we, we drew the line somewhere that uh, based for T TCP and with uh, Wi-Fi frames, uh, one ACK is enough to, to be confident that uh, you're coordinating your Army's efforts so you meet in the middle. Uh, so here's just a comparison of different acknowledgements happening at different layers. Uh, layer two Wi-Fi acknowledgements are just between the station and the access point, whereas layer four TCP acknowledgements are end-to-end -end between the endpoints, right? So if you're talking to a device on the other side of the internet, it's that device on the other side that's acknowledging back at layer four for TCP, okay? Uh, and because I'm gonna talk about window sizes in a bit, during the, the three-way handshake with TCP, that's where they're also negotiating what that window size is. Uh, so different devices can support different window sizes. Uh, the lowest common denominator wins, okay? Now with uh, TCP slow start, uh, you start off sending the first frame or your first segment, and you can wait for that acknowledgement to come back. If you successfully receive that acknowledgement, you can send two segments, and you wait for the acknowledgements for segment two and, and segment three to come back. If those are successful, you can double that and send four segments, and this keeps growing exp exponentially. And so that's what produces that TCP slow start. It takes you a while to ramp up how much data you can actually inject out into the wire, out into the airwaves. Okay, and then what, what happens when you have uh, packet loss? And so we'll walk through a little scenario that talks about that. So here's a little reference. Uh, some of these are older operating systems. Uh, some of them are a little bit newer. Um, but it's just showing the default window size and the time to live uh, for some of these operating systems. Now, if you look on the security side, uh, if you look at tools like Nmap, where they do some enumeration or fingerprinting, uh, these are the sort of metrics the, that they can look at to get an idea of what the operating system is on the under, other side of that uh, of the wire, right? So there's certain signatures based on the responses coming back for your window size and your time to live uh, that can uniquely identify the OS types. 
Uh, you guys, if you go to this website down here at the bottom, uh, for your devices now, depending on the version of OS that you're running, you can figure out what your default window size is. Okay? And what I want to emphasize here is that if you're talking to devices on the other side of the internet, if you're tunneling your traffic back to a controller in the data center or through a VPN tunnel, um, or talking across a satellite link that has a significant latency, even though I have a window size of about 130K, at 200 milliseconds of latency, because of the TCP acknowledgements that need to come back, my maximum throughput is just over five megabits. So if I'm trying to drive as much throughput as I can, my ultimate limiting factor here with 200 milliseconds latency is five megs. So in those early test cases I showed you where I was pushing you know, uh, 216 megs or 32 megs, uh, all three of them should show around five megabits of throughput. And so if you saw five megs, maybe you conclude that encryption had no impact. Okay, but you weren't really looking at uh, truly what was happening. Okay. Uh, so the rate limiting. Uh, so I've, I've had this discussion with um, some people that are uh, brilliant RF minds. Uh, they they um, came from the cellular world. Uh, they, they could probably visualize RF the same way as Jordi LaForge could with his visor, uh, but they didn't understand the Wi-Fi protocol and they didn't understand TCP IP, right? And so what they wanted to do is they wanted to implement a five meg rate limit on their core so any uh, guest traffic connecting to the wireless network would be rate limited deeper into the core at five megabits. And they thought that if we're putting a rate limit on for five megabits, why do we want to enable higher data rates on the wireless side? Because it's just going to be throttled down to the lower data rates at five megabits. So they wanted to selectively go in and shut off all the MCS rates and the higher end um, GNA rates, right? Because they weren't going to push that much traffic anyway. And when you, th you think about them, them describing that, like it, it kind of makes sense sort of where you're going from, but we're looking at, at different layers of the OSI stack. Like really, it's, you, you want those frames to be sent through the airwaves as fast as possible and take up as little airtime utilization as you can. And so it, uh, I think there's some significant holes in your logic, but they, they're pretty convinced that this was the, the case. And so they argued that throttling the user traffic, uh, again, they might as well disable those higher rates because there'd be no benefit to that. Right, so sometimes when you make your guesstimate, it's not always the right guesstimate, right? So come up with your theoretical model, what, what you'd expect, and then run through the test. See what happens. Look at your packet captures. Look at your testing throughput. Does it line up? And so this is kind of a model of what the, they'd set up to test. They're applying a rate limit uh, further down into the network. Uh, here's just some references of the different um, uh, evolutions of the TCP congestion protocol. Right, so inspired by a desert in, in the US, they came up with some, some interesting names for the initial uh, congestion protocols. But they kept enhancing on that to make some improvements. So when we talked about that slow start, um, when you run into a period of congestion, um, the original slow start, as soon as you start to see packet loss, you drop back down to one, and then work your way back up. So you'd see these significant swings in the amount of TCP traffic you're able to push through the network. So they figured, well, maybe when we see congestion, maybe instead of dropping all the way back down to one, maybe we just drop halfway and then work our way back up. And maybe instead of working our way back up exponentially, we do it in a linear fashion, and which can end up in a sawtooth kind of result. Okay. So the results of what we see when we apply the five meg limit, uh, it turns out that if you do the packet captures and you analyze uh, the frames going across the air gap, they are sent at the highest rate that they can between the station and the client, or and the access point, right? So the five meg limit has no direct tie to the data rates you can send across the Wi-Fi medium. It's TCP at a higher layer of the OSI stack that's slowing down this uh, this communication. Okay, and that's where you see this uh, the sawtooth form, right? So as traffic uh, moves up above the threshold, it fails to get acknowledged, and you see a drop off on the traffic, and you have the sawtooth effect from a TCP perspective. Okay. Uh, and here's just an example confirming uh, with this slide that we see similar data rates, uh, whether we have it uh, wide open uh, rate limit or if it's down to you know five meg or one meg rate limit. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't test the reverse. No. Oh, that'd be an interesting one. I didn't try that, but. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Uh, yeah.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would have been a good exercise to go through. Yeah. So default settings. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion on Twitter about you know having vendors uh, set appropriate default settings, and so th- this is my personal view. Uh, with with default settings, you want to position the devices so that they create less harm. If they're never changed, set them so that they they create less harm to other other Wi-Fi devices in the environment. Okay. Now this doesn't mean they'll provide the best performance. It's just you're doing less harm to your neighbors, right? So us as wireless line professionals, the reason we get paid the big bucks is because we know what default settings need to be changed to optimize for performance and align with our design requirements. So in our world, I'd say default settings should always be changed on all the networks we're deploying. But default settings are protect ourselves and other wireless devices from people who don't know that the settings need to be changed. So with that point, know what the default settings are. Okay, so when you start doing your performance testing and you see some results, understand if, if that's because it's a default setting that you need to change. Maybe you need to go to 40 megahertz wide channels. Okay? Change them when appropriate. That's where you guys need to take kind of the bull by the horns. Understand what these default settings are and the implications of changing them. Right? And, and make the changes so that you align with what your design requirements are when you collected the data from your customers. Also, have an expectation of what the results should be. When you do your performance testing, do those numbers make sense? Just don't blindly accept those numbers, okay? Put a model in your head, um, a theoretical model. I, I had a, a professor once who uh, gave us the task of modeling uh, a waveform uh, within a com- computer simulation tool. Uh, if you did a quick uh, reality check, you should have seen a big spike in the middle. Right, that's roughly the form. We didn't know what the exact values would be, but it'd be roughly a shape with a spike in the middle. When we went through the computer simulation tool, the result was a flat line. Now, without thinking about that, some people said, huh, I guess I was wrong with my theoretical model, and they submitted that uh, to get their grade. Now, what happened is the computer model was using its default settings, and it wasn't granular enough to catch that spike in the middle. Right? So you, it was sampling in too big of increments. And so you had to change the default settings. Once you change the default settings, you saw the waveform that you were expecting. Okay. Uh, so another example of doing it wrong. Uh, a group of scientists uh, wanted to do a study on a frog. And so what they did is they grabbed the frog, they placed it on a table, and they cut off one of its legs. And then they yelled at the frog, jump. They yelled again, jump. The frog didn't jump. So the scientists concluded that when you cut off a frog's leg, it goes deaf. All right, so not every conclusion is the right conclusion. Okay, on, on that note, I just wanted to provide a link to a troubleshooting guide. So this is a chapter from the CWNA book. Um, you guys can download this uh, via these URLs. I'll also provide the, uh, this, this PowerPoint presentation, uh, so if you don't have to write this down right now. Um, but that's, that's my presentation. <laughs>